email address. So I will of course try to answer all your questions or later if you have any uh, during the coffee break. Uh, but there is also contact list of the of people who are really proficient in what I will be saying. Maybe a bit further away, yes, it could be okay. Ah, yeah, okay. So uh, I'm Michaela. I'm Anders Stefan, and I will. So far, we have mostly seen kind of the models that we used for the modeling of the exosphere, thermosphere, plasma sphere, all the different kind of spheres around the Earth, which is, of course, very important if you want to determine space weather at Earth. Uh, but, of course, what is affecting us is not just this part of, of the system, but also what's coming from the sun. So we will try to look at how we model this part of all of it, what codes we have available, um, and what you can also do yourself, and what actually you will be doing on Thursday and Friday with my colleague Tina Tin. So, um, as we already saw, you cannot simply just use one model to model it all. Maybe you can in 50 years from now, if you have a very good PhD student who can design something like this. But we have very different physics here close to the sun. We have different physics in the heliosphere and we have different physics close to the Earth. So usually we have space weather modeling tool chains that are basically connecting different models all the way from the solar atmosphere, the solar corona, to the heliosphere. And then what we get at L1 or close to the Earth, we couple to magnetosphere, plasmasphere, exosphere, thermosphere, and we can determine the impacts that we have on the ground, including, for example, the uh, ge uh, geomagnetically induced currents, um, effects on your spacecraft, etc. So we have a tool chain that we are using. And actually, one of these tool chains that you can also use, it's open access to everyone, um, is the Virtual Space Weather Modeling Center. This is not an easy acronym to say, I know that. Actually, now we are lobbying to change it to vSpace, so it's a bit more uh, new generation. But for now, it's called Virtual Space Weather Modeling Center. And I'll show you a little bit uh, how it looks, but Stefan is in charge of it, so if you have more questions, always ask him. So as Stefan already mentioned, we have all these different effects that come from space phenomena. CMEs that have the mass of Himalayas, I believe yesterday, that's, I think, very interesting. But apart from the CMEs, we also have Correlating interaction regions where the fast so solar wind hitches up with the slow one. We have shocks in the interplanetary space that can accelerate your particles. So suddenly you have these protons that have insane energies and those can actually damage the electronics in your spacecraft. This is the spacecraft. I don't know, not a very good drawing, but, but you get it. So we have all these different phenomena that, that occur and that we have to somehow model. So we're trying to basically do that. Himalayas. So this space with the modeling center, this is again, Stefan is in charge of that. But basically, it, it aims to collect all these different models that we can use to build these tool chains. And it gives you, as a user, the flexibility to pick which models you want to couple together. So let's say that you're a forecaster who has a coffee break in three hours. So you want to have your computation done in three hours because you then you want to go for a coffee break, which is completely fine. So in that case, if you need a rapid forecast, you need to have a model chain that is not too complex. You need something relatively approximate that can give you a rapid forecast. On the other hand, maybe if you're more interested in the more complex processes and you need to have higher accuracy, you would want to pick models that have this, uh, that have this uh, uh, elaborate models uh, physics in them. So in that case, you will pick the more advanced models. So this way you can kind of combine uh, the models that you're interested in uh, so that you create um, the kind of a tool chain that is more suitable for, for your purpose. So you will actually work with the Virtual Space Weather Modeling Center on Thursday and Friday. Uh, I'm just like outlining a little bit, a little sneak peek. Look forward to Thursday, it will be a lot of fun. So there's a lot of different models included. So as I mentioned, we start from the solar corona. Corona, the virus, but corona is also the atmosphere of the sun. Then we need to propagate this coronal dynamics to the heliosphere, okay? So to the interplanetary space, so then we have heliospheric models, and then we couple it to the Earth environment. So there we have the magnetosphere, plasma sphere, ionosphere, endosphere, thermosphere, all the other spheres. So there is a lot of models, right now 17. Operational so will be another five that are in yellow that are implemented in this tool chain that you can yourself also pick which ones you will use. And I will also present kind of the basics of how this works, at least some of them, so you have some insight into the type of physics that we generally consider. So here, uh, in the next 30-ish minutes, so we'll see, uh, I will uh, show you from these kind of heliospheric part of it, uh, two different categories. So these coronal models, the heliospheric models, and also um, paradise. Uh, it's 
one from our colleagues, how that can compute particle acceleration because that can be very damaging, for example, to your satellite electronics. So uh, you will get a talk after this showing you all about this, but basically you have access to all of this if you go to the PTL website, uh, to the data collection metadata, but again, you will see it in the next talk. And then you can actually have direct access to the virtual space weather modeling center vSpace coming soon. This is what it looks like. So let's look at the heliosphere. So this is the rest of the PTL school, right? We have already seen this. Now we will focus on the, on the solar part of all of it. So, just like we have with splitting the Earth's neighborhood into the plasma sphere, magnetosphere, etc., we also split the domain that we have on the solar bar. Usually, we do it by defining a coronal model. So again, not the virus, but the solar atmosphere. So here we have very complex physics um, that we probably do not want to expand to the rest of the heliosphere. So in the coronal model, you have to think radiation, coronal heating, how do we model it? We don't even know what is heating up the corona. Well, we have to try somehow. So we have a lot of complex processes uh, here, this, this is why we separate it. And then we have the heliospheric model. So uh, kind of to, uh, for the domain of the interplanetary space where you can then push the dynamics that you resolve here. This is also how I will refer to it. So coronal model is up to 0.1 astronomical units, and then heliospheric model contains the planets it's not up to scale, but I think you can figure that out for yourself, even if you had beer during the lunch. Now, um, why 0.1 astronomical units? It's a nice value. It's not 0.14 or so. Um, but, so there's a little hope that we have when we make these calculations, which is that if, you, if you're smart about where you split the models, at this point where you say, oh, this is heliosphere, we have supersonic and superalphanic solar wind. What it means, if we have a supersonic, superalphanic solar wind, is that the characteristics will only propagate outward. So there will be no information flowing back into the corona. So in that case, the coupling can be one way. Now this is a very nice story. Your question can be, well, is it really? You can look at the Parker solar wind, a very nice model to describe how the solar wind works, so how it evolves around the sun. And from that, you can actually compute that the wind should be supersonic from 2 to 3 solar radii, so very close, and super alphanic 14 to 17 solar radii. So at 0.1 AU, which is 21.5 solar radii, we should be fine. Generally, we're fine, but it just also to maybe outline this to you in case you use this software in the future. We have seen in the past, for example, from Parker Solar Probe data, the wind is not always super alphanic and supersonic. So for example, here in between, these regions, this is uh, measurements between 16 to 22 solar radii by PSP. You see that there are actually regions where we are below the alpha leak Mach number of one. So in these cases, you can, if you do get some behavior like this, maybe stay a bit critical of the model results that you get. But most of the time, we don't have this problem, at least we hope. Okay, so back to this nice picture. I will be talking about three different models. Uh, because it's models that we have been developing here, so of course we have the most knowledge on them, and if you need some help with them, we can provide that. Again, there'll be a list of contacts in the end. So for the coronal model, I'll talk about coconut. For the particle acceleration model, I'll talk about paradise. And for the heliospheric models, I'll introduce Euphoria and Icarus. Already now you can see that we are very good at making acronyms. If, you're, if you wonder how we came to these uh, acronyms, I can mention it later, but usually through democratic voting. So let's start with this one. I think this is uh, kind of uh, the nicest one to explain at first. So what do we need to compute the heliosphere, right? So here we start at 0.1 astronomical units. What do we need for that? Obviously, we will need some kind of observational data that will tell us about the current magnetic state of the sun. For that, we use magnetograms. If you want to also include uh, features such as coronal mass ejections, mass of Himalayas, again, Stefan Stock, then you also need to see how these structures look in space because you want to insert them into your model. So you also need so-called coronograph data that can see the coronal mass ejections. All right, so we have this information and somehow, for the, about the solar corona, and somehow we need to transform them into inner boundary conditions of our heliospheric model. So what we do, uh, what we do by default for now, we have some kind of a coronal model that can be approximate, 
that can be pulled through the MHD, it's up to you what you think, where we feed them a lithogram, and then we try to approximate to what we see, the coronal mass ejections with some kind of model. I'll be more specific in a second. So if you look at how Euphoria and Icarus work, we use a specific type of magnetogram. Let's start there. So we have magnetogram. This is what it looks like. So we see the surface of the sun. We see the magnetic field through the Zeman effect. Uh, and we can tell, okay, these are the regions. We have some active regions, uh, we have sunspots, etc. Well, first thing I need to note, we only see the sun uh, straight like this. We don't see the backside of the sun. So if you actually use the full magnetogram for your calculations, the information regarding the backside of the sun is outdated. Normally we think it's not a big problem. Recently we have been uh, finding out that actually it is a big problem. And even the back magnetic field can influence the features. So this is one, one kind of big source of uncertainty that we are currently facing. But anyway, we use the magnetogram that we can see and that we had before, and we feed it into our simulations. Then, if you want to insert coronal mass ejections that can have very significant impact, as you already saw, uh, on the ionosphere, on your, on your technology, we need to see them through these coronagraphs. For example, we use uh, stereotap. Here you can see what it looks like. So you can see how the coronal mass ejection is ejected and how it evolve, evolves in time, from which you can also tell uh, its structure and its speed, which is, of course, very important for modeling. And then you have to decide, if you see a structure like this, yeah, uh, try to input this into a simulation, you will have a hard time, because this looks very deformed, it looks all over the place. We're not quite there yet, but what we try to do then is to create a coronal mass ejection model, which was also already touched upon by Stefan yesterday, and we try to fit these kind of structures with different geometries. So basically we had kind of agreed that what we see here is basically some kind of a flux rope, <laughs> magnetic flux rope, so we have some kind of a magnetic axis and around which you have twisted lines, so here you can see the kind of cross-section of it, and then it's up to you as a forecaster, what kind of magnetic flux rope model would you use to describe this? You have some very basic ones, uh, you have some that are more advanced, the more advanced of course require more parameters uh, to, to, to describe, so that can be more uncertainties in there, and will also take longer to compute. So there are just some examples. Um, I think Tico will tell you a bit more about it during the workshop, uh, how to pick the model of your CME. But uh, as a forecaster, it's up to you to decide if you want to use what kind of a structure of CME you want to use to describe your coronal mass ejection. Once you have it, you can just insert it into the simulation. And the final step here to define your inner boundary condition of your Hellesberg model is the physical model of the corona. How do we know the velocity of plasma here? Or how do we know the density of the plasma? Well, it's a very good question. Um, right now, what we use uh, in operational setting is the so-called wong shili arch model. So WSA, you will see it a lot and you will actually also use it on Thursday and Friday. What we do there is a bunch of assumptions. It's a very good model, but it's semi-approximate. So we use a potential field source surface extrapolation up to a certain distance, 2.3 to 2.6 solar radii. Then we adjust the flow field a bit through Chapin current sheet, but we don't have to go there. And then basically for each field line, you calculate the so-called expansion factor. You don't have to remember these formulas, don't worry, this is just to impress you. But just to show you what the, what the procedure looks like for all of these field lines that we have that gotten through the extrapolation, we, we <coughs> calculate the expansion factor from the, which then we can directly compute the, the velocity at 0.1 astronomical unit. So as you see, it's not completely random. <laughs> there is some physics associated with it, but we are still neglecting non-potential effects and we are still making heavy approximations on what, how the rate, velocity radial structure is related to the magnetic field. There are these magic constants, and actually we had a great PhD student until recently, Leah Samara was here, and she was trying to look at these different magic constants in this semi-approximate formula and see if you tweak them, how much it changes. Well, it changes, as one would expect. So it runs very fast. It's not too bad, actually. It's surprisingly great. But you can tell that this kind of a model doesn't really give you too much insight into what is happening uh, in the solar corona. So, Anyway, this is what you will be also doing uh, on Thursday and Friday. This is how you define the plasma conditions at 0.1 astronomical units, and then you feed it to the Heliospheric code, Icarus or Euphoria. 
So this is a fairly straightforward code. Um, this is just magnetohydrodynamics with gravity. So you have conservation of density, of momentum, induction equation, and energy with gravity terms in it. And I have been saying eukary uh, eukaryos, wow, <laughs> eukaryos and euphoria. The difference between the two, euphoria was the original baby of Stefan. Icarus is very similar to euphoria in its formulation, but Icarus can also locally refine the grid and do grid stretching. This is very important because sometimes, well, yeah, when you have coronal mass ejections, you might have these strong shocks in your flow field, and of course, these regions have to be better resolved than some others because you want to capture all the gradients that are associated with the shocks. So if you go for Icarus, which is currently being implemented into the operational version of the virtual space with only center, you can define which variables you want to trace. Uh, and once you trace them, you can define, okay, if you see a certain gradient of density or velocity or so being uh, increased here or so, you can locally refine the mesh to better capture it. So this will give you better resolution and faster, faster runtime. So this is the main di difference between the two. The Geophoria is also great, it doesn't have, have this uh, adaptive mesh refinement uh, in it. All right, so let's see what this looks like in real life, well, when you actually run it. This is also a simulation actually shown by Stefan, but the, in my language we see rep say repetition is the mother of knowledge. So you can see that this is the 0.1 AU boundary. This is, in this case, I think 2.1 or so astronomical units. Here is the planet, so you have Earth, you have satellite in there, and you see the solar wind spectrum. So that comes mainly from the WSA model. You see the coronal mass ejections being injected into the heliospheric field that comes from fitting the chronograph data with the CME models, and then you let them propagate with the magnetohydrodynamic equations that we saw two slides above. And then you can just put a spacecraft somewhere on Earth and see how the plasma density and velocity and so forth will evolve in time, and then you can compare it to what you observe, and hopefully it's not that far away. Then, um, of course, one aspect of space weather is, is the actual plasma coming at you, the, the mass, the coronal mass ejections, for example, and the shocks. But these shocks can actually also accelerate particles, as we already heard also from Stefan. And Nicolas Bresson, our colleague, has made a code, a code called Paradise, which actually can resolve how particles get accelerated. If you, if you give it a background plasma field, like this one, you can use Paradise to actually resolve uh, how particles can get uh, accelerated in these regions, so also then whether they will impact certain satellites or the Earth, and what the spectrum will look like. I will not go into too much detail. Nicholas is much more knowledgeable on this than I will ever be. But of course, to resolve such kinetic processes, you cannot use magnetohydrodynamics. Well, you can, but it will be wrong, so you shouldn't. So what he actually did in his code is to use this so-called focus transport equation, and what you're actually describing is the you're solving for the directional particle intensity as a function of the coordinates, so in 3D, uh, and the angle and the magnitudes of the momentum and in time. So you have a variety of coefficients here that you have to play with. You have different diffusion coefficients, diffusion tensors, uh, but it has had very nice results, and basically, if you feed it a good background field, you can then determine how the particles will get accelerated and what kind of particle spectra you can expect. So for example, here I have a nice a video from him. Here you have three stations. You will have a, when it loads, you will see a CME being ejected into the heliospheric flow field. And there will be three stations where the particle intensity is measured. And you see that as the CME is hitting these different stations, they are measuring higher and higher intensities of the particles as a function of time. So this is just particle intensity, but of course what you also care about is the actual particle spectrum so what particles will have which, uh, at which frequencies you'll have how many particles, because then you can also determine how much damage they can do to your electronics, for example, on your, on your satellites. All right, let's get over this, and yeah. So let's go back to this Euphoria and Icarus, so the heliospheric flow field. Here we saw that when we looked at this system level diagram, that we have this WSA model based on the potential uh, field of extrapolation, right? And we, had, we saw that we are basically tracing these magnetic field lines and calculating the expansion factor. But you can already imagine that there is a lot of uncertainty associated with this relatively semi-approximate calculation. And you don't have that much insight into what is actually happening. So uh, an idea how to improve basically the entire heliospheric modeling was to re 
replace this semi empirical kernel model by something that is full 3D and MHD. So you're no longer making any kind of semi approximate uh, relations uh, using any uh, semi approximate relations. You're not relying on some numbers. Well, you are, but in a much more complicated sense. Um, and we try to actually resolve the full 3D um, picture and not make any assumptions regarding the field being potential and so forth. And this is how coconut came to play. It stands for cold plate kernel unstructured because it's based on a cold plate framework. What is difficult here, however, you can say, oh, let's just make a code. You can always make a code. If you have a PhD student or a master's student, you can always make a code. However, we are interested in a forecasting ability, right? We don't want the code that takes 40 hours on a supercomputer to compute because that kind of a forecast is not very useful because these kernel mass ejections, for example, they can arrive even in 18 hours. They can be very, very fast. So if you're a forecaster, you're interested in having your forecast within a few hours. This is a Pythia school. Pythia, I learned, is, uh, was an oracle in Delphi that was predicting future. I know because my boyfriend is Greek, so whenever I mention something in Greek, I get a lecture. But it's very good because this way I learn a lot. So we are about forecasting, right? Uh, we hopefully do it better than Pythia, but we, because we have physical, physically informed models. But that's basically the biggest challenge when making something like this, because if you want to have forecast six hours in advance, let's say at least, and your fastest CMEs arrive, let's say, 16 in 16 hours, you have 10 hours to make these entire calculations, and probably you should have some buffer there as well. So for us, the operational requirement or the requirement we put on ourselves is to have these calculations done in two to three hours. So this is where we're getting into the interesting part of global kernel modeling. So let's go to coconut again. Uh, what we are doing is, in a way, we are still using magnetohydrodynamics. So we are still solving similar sort of equations as euphoria. Uh, so we have uh, density conservation, uh, mass conservation, momentum induction, and energy conservation. But of course, since we have these more elaborate processes happening closer to the sun uh, that we have to take into account, we have some additional terms that are representing, now we have it submitted, heat conduction, radiation, and also coronal heating. How do we approximate coronal heating when we do not even know what causes it? It's difficult, and actually, we don't know. We have some good rules of thumb that we put into the code. We see what it does. Um, it's not doing 100% this job, but it also, it's also interesting if you have a code like this and you have some theory on what might be causing the coronal heating, you can actually put it into the code and see where it deposits the energy and momentum. And based on that, you can actually see if it's a viable theory for coronal heating or not, at least to a certain degree. So, but in comparison to euphoria, we also have it based on this so-called cold plate framework, which is very heavily parallelized and it's an implicit scheme and unstructured grids. So this allows us to get really uh, fast at, at computing the solutions. So here are some examples of what we can resolve. So in the background are pictures from solar eclipses, which are great, solar eclipses are great if you're in a country where you can see the sun, so not usually Belgium, but if you go somewhere else, no, no, usually Belgium is fine, but you don't see the sun. That's why we study it, because we want to look at it. But if you, if you go for a solar eclipse, you, you have the moon there, so you can very clearly see the structure of the solar corona. And that's what we use, because you can see in the white light images exactly the magnetic field lines, how they, how they are, uh, what, how the topology looks like. And over that, we can overline the field lines computed from our code, which serves as a great way to validate what we are trying to resolve. So this is the minimum activity, so you can see almost the dipole-like structure, and this is the maximum of, uh, uh, activity. We are doing fairly well so far on the performance, uh, from the performance point of view. So the other state of art uh, global kernel code wind predict is actually 35 times slower than ours. So that's great, but we still have a long way to go to really make it physically accurate. So, so for now, I just showed you the solar wind. So what we can get basically from the magnetogram. But obviously, we need to prescribe <coughs> everything here for the heliospheric model. So we also need the CME part. And this is where it's getting pretty interesting because it means that you have to insert the kernel mass ejection structure into coconut. And that's what uh, our colleagues are doing, Luis and Jinhan. And we basically now also have this version where you can insert a uh, kernel mass ejection, but of course, since we start in the lower corona, you can actually insert it as a small flux rope near the surface of the sun and see what it does. And if it's unstable, it will actually erupt. And then you can try to study 
this eruption that you see of the coronal mass ejections, how well it um, resembles what you actually see in the coronal graphs. So this way we can also study the more fundamental dynamics and eruptivity of coronal mass ejections and hopefully also eventually better match what we are getting then and what we are inputting into the heliospheric models in terms of CMEs. So here you can see a very nice video that might by uh, Jin Han Guo. So you see um, the eruption and the subsequent propagation uh, of the CME. So when I mentioned before with euphoria, you can insert a torus, a sphere map, very simple geometries. Here, since we insert them much closer, then they have the freedom to evolve and we can actually achieve much more complicated shapes in the domain that are then later input into the heliospheric code. But this is still a work in progress and we're we have some first simulations, but this is not yet used for forecasting purposes. So we have some more plans, obviously, for this code, uh, which is also going to be interesting. I heard from some of you from Gira. So we have now extended it to two fluid modeling, so we can have separately ions and neutrals. We also want to extend the domain down to capture the transition region and chromosphere, because a lot of dynamics actually happens in the chromosphere and transition region. So if we can extend it down there, we can probably much better capture already the, the lower part of the processes that then drive the uh, thermodynamics in the, in the corona. But of course, in the chromosphere or photosphere, the ionization fraction is not one, or not, or not even close to one. So you actually have to separately uh, resolve ions and neutrals, which is why we have been extending this fr framework to two fluid and now also three fluid uh, formulation. And uh, of course, we have to still include many more performance enhancers so that this can actually run in an operational setting uh, within a couple of hours. So um, this is kind of a summary of the code that I showed you. Again, this is uh, all of them are available, or at least soon to be available, or in the beta version of the virtual space weather modeling attempt. So I'll now I'll also show you kind of a sneak peek into what you will be doing on Thursday and Friday. So as you will sh be shown in a bit, you can actually access the VSWMC from the PTA website. And when you come there, you actually can directly just click on a new run. So this is a nice picture, right? But you ignore it, and you just can go for a new run. They also have history, but it doesn't matter that much. And there, you can pick actually what kind of model chain you want to pick, which one you want to simulate. So for example, euphoria, euphoria with indices, euphoria with, well, paradise is not in this version yet. Uh, but there is this many different models. I think Tico will use euphoria with CME in them. And then once you click on it, you will be first shown information about what the code does, how it operates, <laughs> what it requires. And then you can actually click down there to select it if you really know that you want this code. And once you do there, uh, you can actually just directly select uh, what, what uh, the CME parameters that you want to add the CME in it, what kind of resolution you want, what kind of magnetogram, and then you just click on submit and then you can have a run. So this is something that you will be doing um, and at least for now, it's all basically paid for you, all this computational time. So you can experiment with it, play with it, and see what it does. OK. Um, also, all this software is open source, and publications are open access. Of course, just because software is open source doesn't mean it can be easily used by everyone, because this software is pretty complex. Uh, but all of it is out there. So if you're interested in using any of this, please let us know. Uh, and we will be very happy to help you, because since it's all in the developmental stage. Not everything is completely documented. We're working on it, but we're always open to, to, using, uh, to you using this and to helping potential end users. So if you have questions, and this is mostly for the recording, um, when you, I know it's a lot of information that I've just given you in not that, not that late, so that's nice. Um, but if you have any questions regarding how to use you for uh, how to do, how to pick your CME model, what is good for you, what isn't good for you, how to use Paradise, how to use Coconut, etc how to use the VSWMC. Go back to this slide. All of these people, I promise you, are super nice people who are very willing to answer any questions. You can, of course, always message Stefan, but maybe he'll just direct your request to somebody else. Um, and yeah, we are very open to all sorts of collaborations. And actually, that's the best for us, because we put the codes out there. We know what they do. We know how to use them. But only when somebody else uses them for maybe something different, we can find the bugs and find the limitations that we have and areas that we have to further improve on. So we are very, very open to that. So with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope we still have five or so-ish minutes for, for questions. Thank you.